All right, everybody, welcome back to the latest installment of Chat for God. This week, we are going to be continuing our discussion from last week on some ideas out of the work from Simone Weil, one of my favorite Christian authors, and just one of the most wild and independently minded, but truly sincere and passionate Christians of the 20th century. And last week, if you recall, I did just kind of my little personal quick and dirty intro to Simone Weil's work. But this week, earlier this morning, as a matter of fact, as I was preparing to record for today's podcast, I was rereading Gravity and Grace. And there were some particular ideas in there that I was struck by. So I was taking some notes. And then, as I do, I started tweeting about some of them. And one of the tweets in particular caught a little bit of fire, and I noticed that it was very polarizing, and I thought this was quite interesting, but I took it as a signal that maybe we should zoom in on this one. Maybe we should really try to unpack this one. The question is about whether or not God even exists, okay? You might think that's crazy, right? Because, oh, you say, Justin, you're, I thought you were a Christian. Does that mean you have to think that God exists? Well, actually, no. It doesn't mean you have to believe that God exists. And this is why people like Simone Weil and the truly profound, honest, radically incisive Christian thinkers are so amazing because they're not just saying what they think they're supposed to be saying. They're really trying to think through what it even means to believe in God. And when you go deep on that and you're really honest, you go into some crazy places. You don't necessarily need to believe that God exists in order to be a Christian. That might sound crazy to a lot of people. And evidently, if Twitter's any evidence, uh, yeah, this does not make people happy. A lot of people do not like this idea, but it's actually very straightforward. And I'm even going to go so far as to say in this podcast, I'm going to make the case to you that God does not exist and that you should still be a Christian. You should still go to church. You should still pray because those are good things to do. And it is true. God is true in a certain sense, but God does not exist. And it's a really good example, I think, of how contemporary Christians, like public intellectual Christians, what gets called Christian today, is actually just a whole lot of nonsense. And there's a lot of so-called Christian ideas that are really just kind of vulgar, saccharine niceties. It's like stuff that people want to tell themselves because it just feels good. And also, it's good for marketing Christianity. It's good to, for you know bringing new people into Christianity. But it's often pretty dumb and doesn't actually make sense and often in a weird way kind of betrays the radical truth at the core of Christianity. And I think this is a really, really good example because we all want to think, you know, that God exists. If you believe in God, if you're the type of person who believes in God, you generally want to think God exists, God is real. You know, these terms that we use that give things substance in our minds, you want to be able to apply those terms. But that's not what Christianity is about, actually. It's if you read Simone Weil, you get a totally different vision of what Christianity even means. God is not your buddy. God is not something that you have access to. God is not, God is radically withdrawn. God has forsaken us. He's nowhere to be found. And that is okay. That's part of what is interesting and significant and ultimately, in an ultimate sense, real about God, that there is something missing. There's something withdrawn. All right. So, we're going to try to unpack all of this because I know for a lot of people, it's super confusing. And to some people, it's downright idiotic to say that God doesn't exist and to also be a Christian. All right. So that's what we're going to try to unpack today. Let me start with restating to you all, because if you're listening to this on the podcast, you might not have seen this on Twitter, the tweet that I posted. All right. What I said was, I am increasingly convinced that Christianity remains simply misunderstood by almost everybody, including so many Christians. The crux of the matter is best summarized as follows. God does not exist. That is why one prays. That was the tweet that a lot of people thought was wrong. Uh, but then actually a lot of people came through and agreed with me. And people I quite respect, people like uh, Jacob Phillips, my old friend from England, who's an actual theologian and all around interesting, cool dude who does his own independent thinking and writing on the internet. And also my friend Dana uh, of the Pleasure Helmet podcast. Shout out to both of these people who are really interested in thinking about this stuff 
radically and honestly. Before we even get in, into the substance of what people like Simone Weil and Meister Eckhart have said on this topic, let's start with just the obvious layer of argumentation. Like, I think it's pretty obvious that God doesn't exist. Have you ever talked with him in person, like at a diner? <laughs> no. Have you ever seen him even? No, you haven't. Okay. So just keep that in mind as we start. Like people are asking me, what could you possibly mean by that saying God doesn't exist? I mean, like in the obvious sense, he just is not a part of our world in some basic obvious sense, right? Okay. Uh, I think you can tell yourself all kinds of interesting, impressive mental gymnastics to explain why God exists. But I think at the end of the day, like when you talk to a normal person, a normal secular atheist person who's a fallen a fallen heathen who is not a Christian, they're just going to be like, oh, you say God exists? Okay, well, obviously he doesn't, so you're stupid. <laughs> like I think that's what most people think when they hear about Christians believing in God, okay? So just keep that in mind, all right? Um, but let's get, let's get down into the depths, all right, shall we? So here's a starting quote from Simone Weil that inspired my observations today. What Simone Weil basically says is that to think of God as existing is to be like a miser is toward his box of treasure or uh, chest of treasure. It's basically a kind of vulgar, greedy way of consoling oneself and clinging to something as yours that, that in fact is not yours and is in fact a uh, quite degenerate way of thinking and acting. What Simone Weil says, and I quote, is this. She says, when God has become as full of significance as the treasure is for the miser, we have to tell ourselves insistently that he does not exist. We must experience the fact that we love him, even if he does not exist. All right, so the whole point of loving God and praying to God and paying attention to God and being a Christian is precisely the fact that God is something that is superior to everything that exists. If he just existed, that would be kind of lame, right? Uh, not exactly worthy of worship. It was just another thing that exists, right? Um, and that is a kind of degenerate attitude, like the miser loves his gold or treasure. But we can get more specific with it because what she says is that God withdraws precisely in order to prevent this problem of us getting overly comfortable and profane with it. So the idea here is that God puts everything into existence. God is the kind of condition for existence, but is then not existent himself precisely so that we might know the, the feeling of respect and, and distance that we know towards God by thinking about it. Okay. So to say that he exists makes him near and makes him small and makes him uh, this like thing that we can just obtain or, or that is within existence. Okay, what Simone Weil says, the, the actual quote I'm referring to at this point is, she says, it is he who, through the operation of the dark night, withdraws himself in order not to be loved like the treasure is by the miser. I love this, the operation of the dark night. God imposes this operation, this kind of mechanism on existence as such to forestall our earthly sinful tendencies to just be greedy and to possess things and to reduce them and to hoard them as a consolation for the challenge of existence itself. Okay. And so this has really important implications. So think about what this means for the activity of prayer, for instance. What Simone Weil is saying is that when we pray as Christians, we're not talking to some guy who exists. That is so dumb and lame also. We pray in some part because God does not exist. We pray because we are helpless, because there's something seriously missing. God has abandoned us. God doesn't exist. And the difficulty of that void is precisely what we're grappling with when we pray to God. She even goes as far as to say that one should purposefully, when praying, 
have in one's mind the thought that God does not exist. You should be thinking about that while you're praying. She calls this a method of purification. She says to pray to God, not only in secret, as far as men are concerned, but with the thought that God does not exist. She calls that a method of purification. And the secret here is interesting. It reminds one of Deleuze, actually, who talks about becoming imperceptible. That when you're doing something real and honest and true, you don't need to be signaling it to the public. It doesn't matter if anyone understands. You should not be worried about, you know, communicating the existence of God to other people, trying to convince people that they should be Christian because God is loves you and God exists and God is your buddy. Like, that's dumb. You shouldn't be doing that. Um, you shouldn't even tell people that you pray. I don't really tell people that I pray. Frankly, it's because I'm a little embarrassed because Christianity to a lot of people just seems stupid. Uh, and it's obviously a kind of low status thing, but it's also that I don't want to profane what I think is the radical underlying truth of Christianity by putting it into these different kinds of corny terms that you need to put it into if you want it to be understood by people, uh, especially if you want other people to like it. So if you want to speak about Christianity in terms that other Christians are going to be like, oh, cool. Yeah, I like that. I like you. I want to be a part of your thing. You have to basically speak in the most bastardized words that are so corny and cringe, and that's what you want to avoid. And Deleuze says the same thing about philosophy. Basically says you shouldn't be worried about convincing other people of your philosophy. You shouldn't be going to academic conferences. You shouldn't even worry about being understood because to do that, you're going to essentially be marketing yourself, and that's an intrinsic kind of corruption of the radical truth and creative line of flight that you want to be on as a philosopher. Simone Weil is saying something very similar uh, with Christianity. So men should pray in secret, and men should pray specifically with the thought that God does not exist. When I say man, I don't mean the male, like, chromosomes. I mean l'homme, as they say in French. L'homme. <laughs> H-O-M-M-E. Just man in general. Human being, Okay. Don't get on my case for that. Now, there is an important qualification here, and this is where I can give the most ground to the people who are saying that, of course, God exists, and you're a heretic, Justin. And it's the point is this. It's that if you love God and if you do pray while nonetheless thinking that he does not exist or admitting that he does not exist— then he will manifest his existence. And that's pretty much also straight out of Simone Weil. And I think this is a absolutely correct insight. What she says is, if we love God while thinking that he does not exist, he will manifest his existence. So I think for people who are true believers, to them it feels like, of course, God exists. Like my friend Ashley, for instance. People who feel God around them all the time. I have nothing but respect for them. And I'm not poo-pooing them in any way. I'm certainly not calling them liars. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. What I am saying is that you only really get there if you, at least at some point in the past, have confronted the absolute void, what Simone Weil calls the void. And I think for normal, you know, secular atheist people, the void is this non-existence of God. It's, it, is, it is this reality that God, in, in a basic, straightforward sense, does not really exist. And one has to confront that, one has to accept that, and one has to love God anyway. One has to pray anyway. One has to face that void anyway. And if you do that genuinely, then you could say that God's existence is manifested in, in some sense. All right? So... That's an important wrinkle for sure. I don't want to paint with too broad of a brush. Now, what I want to do, though, is I want to go into more depth on what existence even means and in the Christian tradition. Because you know what? One of the things I really start to get annoyed at is when, you know, impressive, accomplished, credentialed Christians come at me in my mentions and say things like calling me an idiot and barking at me as if I'm a troll or as if I'm just, you know, trying to draw attention to myself. I seriously don't troll. I really don't. I only tweet things I really think are true in some non-trivial sense. I mean, often things mean different things to different people. So that's always a, some source of confusion. But 
I don't troll. I really don't. For what it's worth, even my friend Ashley, shout out to Ashley, got in the, the Twitter pylon and called my, my tweet a weak troll. Ashley, I'm not trolling. And if I do troll, it's not weak. But this is not a troll, okay? Uh, genuinely. So for all the legit Christians out there, and I've always been very honest that I'm not a good Christian. I don't pretend to be an accomplished or sophisticated Christian. I don't know much at all. But I do think a lot, and I do think hard, and I do think honestly, and I do have some perspectives on it. So I'm just trying to figure that out. That's the whole point of this podcast, all right? To the more sophisticated Christians, I want to I want to play ball a little bit, all right? I think what I'm saying is actually not that provocative. There's a pretty established tradition or lineage that affirms what I'm saying. Other very smart and impressive, you know, great, genuine Christians out there who have affirmed what I've what I'm essentially saying. So I want to talk about a few examples, some absolute bosses. Let's talk about Meister Eckhart, okay? The uh, no big deal, the German theologian and philosopher and mystic who is widely admired and respected, all right? Uh, But also the absolute unit of Western Christianity, Thomas Aquinas himself, okay? Let's do this. So my friend Jacob alerted me to a famous quote from Meister Eckhart, where he says, by the way, go go say hi to Jacob. He's on Twitter at, at Countered Lagos. And uh, the quote is in German. I don't know German, so I'm, I might totally butcher this, but uh, I don't know how to pronounce it. Ein Gott. <laughs> Why is it that whenever people uh, say German words, they always do it in the voice of Hitler? That That is some perverse thing where... Uh, you know, the thing that we do good or Westerners hate the most is what always creeps back into our consciousness. Okay, I'll, I will avoid saying it like Hitler. Ein Gott, den is gibt, gibt es nicht. And if you put this through Google Translate, it comes out as a God, because there is, does not exist. But what Jacob said is that it, is generally translated as a God that exists does not exist. So obviously we're dealing with paradoxes here. We're dealing with mysteries. We always are when it comes to religion. Okay. But this is a, a, I think very strong little data point in favor of what I'm saying, at least to prove to you, you don't have to believe me. You don't have to agree. Like these things are always very debatable and I respect that, but I'm just throwing some data points on the table here for the people that are calling me troll or who think I'm just talking nonsense to, you know, provoke discussion or to attract attention. Okay, I'm not. There's good past reasoning to support me. Okay, so that's one. But now let's talk a little bit about Thomas Aquinas. And this came up in the mentions also. A few people were saying that, for instance, you know, that famous line in Genesis about uh, when God basically says in the Old Testament, when God says, I am who I am, or it's sometimes translated as I am that I am. And it's actually translated in a few different ways. Uh, one is I am he who is, actually, is another way of translating it. So it's obscure. These things are always obscure. But people were pointing that out as an example of the fact that God exists, that that's God saying I exist. But guess what, folks? It's not that simple. So let me give you an interpretation of Aquinas's famous statement, the the famous quote unquote ipsum essay subsistence. Okay, so this is a phrase uh, that Aquinas introduced, and it basically means the act of being itself. So the the idea is that God is the actual verb to be itself. That's what God is. That that's how uh, Robert Barron, Bishop Robert Barron, in explains it as, quote-unquote, it means the sheer act of to be itself, okay? And Aquinas argued that God is ipsum esse subsistence. God is simply the sheer act of to be itself, okay? So think about what this really means. What it means is that God does not exist. God is the act of existence. God is the condition for the possibility of existence. Okay, so... Where does all of this go? Where does this leave us? Ultimately, 
what I think this means is that if you are leaning towards Christianity, maybe you're interested in it, maybe you feel drawn to it, but you're educated and a rational person and you're just kind of like, you know, I could never really quite say to myself or others that I really believe God exists. So therefore, that's why I'm blocked from getting deeper into my Christianity. Then this is big news for you. Like you, this should not be blocking you from taking your faith seriously and really exploring it further. You don't have to believe that God exists. You don't. There's a very good case to be made that God does not exist. Other people will argue differently, and that's fine. But you can say God does not exist, and you'll be in good company. And there are very reasonable, compelling ways to understand that statement that is fully consistent with a genuine and passionate Christianity. So I would say read Simone Weil. Read these more interesting and challenging Christian thinkers who don't just give you what's nice to hear, but give you these dark, deep, weird, difficult reflections. And ultimately, this is what I think is most valuable about Simone Weil in particular. I'm essentially doing a series, I guess, on Simone Weil at this point. And I want to really stress that for her, it's like Christianity is not about making sense with the intellect and neither is it about feeling good or feeling wholesome or feeling like spiritually uplifted. None of that stuff is what Christianity is about. It's about light. She says that just being able to pay attention with radical accuracy to what exists, if you can simply do that, to apply light to what is good and what is bad and what exists and what doesn't exist, to just apply light as completely as possible, is actually an act of extreme pain and suffering. It's very, very difficult. It's very, very hard. It generally causes great affliction because it really ultimately means detachment from things and everything you think you love and know, uh, all of it pretty much gets destroyed when you allow enough light to be shown upon it. So it's painful. It's really, really difficult. But if you do that, then you encounter this void. And if you allow that void to just be there, then grace will enter in. That is one of Simone Weil's kind of key propositions. And, you know, I think that is a very, very wise message and ultimately a true message that to be a Christian, it's not like, you know, walking around and saying cringe stuff about like, you know, are you ready to let Jesus into your heart? Like, I'm not saying that's bad to say. It's fine. But that's not what it's about. And if that turns you off, I think there are good reasons why that should turn you off. Because it's not about that kind of sweet saccharine consolation. It's about like deep, difficult, often almost unspeakable truths related to our challenge that we face in existing as limited, highly limited fallen creatures. And yeah, I think that's essentially just what I want to leave you with that intellect and the imagination are for Simone Weil, two of the biggest obstacles. And that if you can simply just look at things without intellect or imagination, and just allow that the emptiness of human life to, to really surround you and nothing but that emptiness to surround you, then it's painful and it's weird and hard and dark. But then you might just find that grace enters in and something like God manifests presence. And so that's kind of a whole separate set of dynamics, let's say, in the kind of emotional, intellectual, and spiritual process, I guess, of Christianity. And frankly, I'm not even there yet. Like, I'm a bad Christian. I'm a shallow Christian. I'm just, I, I feel called to it. I do believe it's true. I do have faith that it's true, but I don't really know. And I don't really feel comfortable with it, and I have many kind of sinful, conflicted um, forces in me that pull me in different directions, like kind of being ashamed of it because it's seen as cringe and stupid and low status, and, you know, I'm a professional and all of that. And uh, so I still struggle with all of that. So I'm not like a model Christian, never pretended to be. That's the whole point of this podcast, Chat for God, is that I'm just chatting about 
where I'm at and uh, in all of its like pretty crappy and sinful uh, nature. So, but the, the what I'm trying to ultimately leave you with today is uh, some recognition that to do that honestly and to confront that honestly is essentially the work of of deepening your faith. That is essentially the work of 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 committing to to Christianity. Is simply confronting that and simply trying to do it honestly. And I think personally, I would add to that the, the element of trying to speak the truth as best as you can, frankly and almost recklessly, in public is an essential part of the kind of parisiastic lineage in which Christ explicitly sits, because that is a word that he actually uh, mentions, or it is mentioned in the Gospels pretty pretty explicitly around some of his public speech activity. Okay, so that's what I would leave you with, I think. Uh, you know, don't go to church to try to be a good person, or don't try to uh, go to church to feel good, or to talk with God, who's like your buddy in the sky. No, you should go to church and you should pray because God does not exist and because you don't really understand and because you don't really know what to make of any of this stuff. 